So that was, uh, that was the introduction you all missed because you, uh, those of you that missed the previous lecture, um, thanks to Jan Maas who did a great job uh, motivating uh, what I will speak about and uh, motivating and also developing uh, in a very nice way inspired by uh, what happens in continuous spaces the notion of uh, Ritchie curvature and discrete. Um, so I will speak about uh, a different approach. Uh, by comparison, it might seem more pedestrian, uh, but it's more discrete-minded um, because we're trying to do this in discrete spaces. And uh, so it's, it's a different uh, point of view. Um, So unfortunately, I will skip some of the motivation uh, out of respect to to the people that attended the first lecture and to Jan Maas, but I will I'll mention briefly. Um, okay, thanks again. Thanks for inviting me and for hosting me at the Simons Institute. Um, what I wrote here as an exercise is actually the first uh, little lemma or proposition I proved after coming here during the first workshop. Uh, in real analysis in computer science with my former postdoc, Kevin Costello. Um, OK, so uh, also, I, I'm sorry, I might sit down for part of the lecture or most of the lecture as I'm recovering from uh, some leg injury. Um, OK, so. Uh, this is a confession slide saying that uh, what we don't know is uh, as interesting or uh, maybe more interesting than what we do know. So before I tell you what we're able to do, let me show you a couple of problems that we would like to, but we're still struggling to do. So, okay, as you, G is the graph. And uh, now the main definition here is MTAB, which is the T midpoint set. Okay, so for t equals one half, it is the midpoint set, as in take, so a and b are two subsets of vertices. And for every little a in capital A, little b in capital B, um, you use the graph distance, let's say, and look at, um, look at points along any shortest path between little a and little b. And by t midpoint, we mean points that are fraction t of the distance from A. And in the set MTAB, you take union over all geodesics, over all shortest paths, all such midpoints. So that's MTAB. Is the definition of MTAB clear? So it needs to be for every A in A and B in yes. B, it should be precisely in this ratio. No, 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 no. no. There exists every, every geodetic. <laughs> yeah. Take all the points yeah. that are the, the point ah. that is in. Ah, the ah, ah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. 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 And okay. You, because this is uh, on a graph, you might have a question saying, okay, well, what do I do if t is? Sorry. Yeah. I, did, I didn't understand the answer to the previous question. There's a for all on a and b. It should be. Yeah, the for all, but <coughs> you have to understand it correctly. It's. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of experience with for all. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that this is true for all A and B, but you, you look at all A and B and you take all these points. <laughs> this is what Nati way. just explained. Take a geodetic for me. Okay, it's good. Well, it's a deep point proportion, that point joint. It's the pre-existent. It's the pre-existent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's yeah, so the you easy. were saying about <laughs> ST is irrational. Or right. So just take, uh, I, I'll be generous. So by T midpoint, take the floor of, uh, whatever you see here, TDAB, and also the ceiling. Okay, so if you had 2.5, take the thing that's at distance 2 and distance 3. It should only make our problem easier because the question then is that of bounding the size of these midpoints in terms of the sizes of A and B. Right? Okay, so I let you round up and down. So that's it. And so. Uh, seems like a natural question to ask, but I don't think has been studied uh, 
you know, in, in discrete lit literature as much, um, is a sort of Brun-Minkowski inequality. Okay, where so for now, uh, forget about the e to the distance square term. So the c greater than or equal to zero here actually is not a typo. So I let you choose c equals zero to start with, so you still have an inequality that's saying, is it true that the size of the T midpoints is at least? So this I ask for discrete N cube, you can ask for your favorite graph. And, uh, and once again about the quantifiers, yes. uh, you want to show that for every you would like to, C or? You would like to prove <coughs> Okay, you would like to show there exists a constant because I've given the dependence on C over N here. For the discrete cube, we would like to show there exists an absolute constant C so that for every A, B subsets of vertices of the but cube, this is... Do you allow C to depend on T? Or, or, uh, or would you be interested in this question just for T equals one half? Uh, I, hopefully I took the dependence out with this T times one minus T. Uh, so C should be... Yeah. So, for example, if t equals a half, it turns out c. You know, then you may not see the dependence on of c on t. But uh, it's a theorem by Jan Olivier and Cedric Villani that for t equals one half, this is true with c one over sixteen. Okay. So what we know is, if t equals one half, this is true. And we don't know for other t. Ah, uh, yes. So, so d is uh, d a b is the minimum. Minimum between so take as usual the distance between two sets, which is defined as if they intersect, the distance is zero. Otherwise, take between the nearest points. Okay, but so minimum like overall a little a little. So what's the case of equality? Sorry? What is the case of equality? Uh, oh, I. <coughs> what? Mm, when is this Both exactly equal? I, actually, it's a good question. I, up, okay, this is tight, uh, but with the constant, I'm not sure. We know. But if you take, right, you say, let's take a ball. Um, you know, let's take A and B to be antiparole points, for example, and take uh, take a ball of uh, radius one half n. Then you get and choose n over two here. And uh, you know, f the best thing is to take the log of the whole thing. So you see that this is a linear term then. And then, uh, um, and over here. There's a c over n, and d square is gives is going to give you n square, so you get linear in n as well. Yeah. So it, it is tight, but um, yeah, characterization of equality even for t equals one half, I'm not sure is, is not. <coughs> but, that, but that's a good guess. Yeah. This fragility to intersection between the sets seems a little unnatural. Uh, Sorry. This fragility to having the sets intersect seems. Yes, so actually what they prove is something stronger. Um, this is replaced by, and this, uh, now I should watch how I call it. This is replaced by, you could take uniform or whatever measure on A and B, support with support on A and B, and take Kantorovich Wasserstein distance between those two measures, uh, W1, the W1. Just Kantorovich. Just got <laughs> <laughs> so this is going back to a remark from an early, at the end of the earlier lecture when uh, W. Uh, Sergei said, uh, according to Varshik, uh, it should be referred to as Kantorovich distance rather than Wasserstein. Um, actually, the first time I encountered uh, this, um, I saw it as Krov, K R O B metric. Krov metric, and that's for Kantorovich, Rubinstein, Ornstein, Wasserstein, where Wasserstein is written with the V. <laughs> so this is this is some other. I don't know if that makes anybody happy. <laughs> um, again, this is just saying yes. This is a bit fragile, but actually you could replace it by something like uh, 
the, which is what they prove. Okay, and the second, almost the second natural, second favorite graph of uh, <coughs> many discrete people is uh, the symmetric group with, uh, you pick whether you want Hamming distance or transposition distance, right? So what is the Hamming distance on the symmetric group? Um, well, so you look at the permutations and Hamming distance as in, you know, just number of coordinates. Oh, you're right there. <laughs> One through, yeah. Permutations of n symbols and just coordinate-wise. I mean, they're within a factor of two of each other, so it's, that's why I say it's, you know, it doesn't matter which one you want to choose. Um, and then one can ask the same question. So here we know less. Here what we know is um, with c equals 0, we can show for t equals 1 half. So as in simple Brun-Minkowski, but just for t equals one half. So those are two open questions. If you don't care for the rest of the talk, it work on your favorite. Is there a candidate set, the pair of sets A and B, for which this should be optimal? Yeah, this, this is a more tricky question because even so, so this, these inequalities, as uh, Jan mentioned, are strong enough, are so strong that they imply log so, you know, modified log Sobolev concentration and so on. So uh, even for the concentration, it depends on the parameters t. I don't think we know the extremal sets. Yes? So I don't know. No, I don't have, easy, yeah, you're. Yeah. Do people think that? Again, I, I think, yeah, I think we're, uh, you know, your guess may be better than my guess. Um, but I don't think. It's taking take, the. Take a ball around the one. Exactly. Take a ball around A to one. Say the identity permutation, yes. Um, I think we don't know even qualitatively what, whether this, such a result is true, and so we haven't, yeah dared ask that question, but maybe, maybe one should start there, yeah. I don't know. Okay, so. I thought just a question about yeah. integer parts and pesky things like that. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I mentioned, uh, now I can see who came in uh, earlier. Than later. <laughs> um, so for the midpoint, T midpoint set, I said, uh, will be generous. You can take both the rounded up and down and put them both in there. And in fact, for the, for the, so what I mentioned was for the first result, um, that I'll show what Olivier will improve, but this one for t equals one half is a theorem, and uh, they, they do include both the floor and ceiling in the definition. Okay, so let's see, did I skip something? No. So there's, I am uh, less, uh, complete compared to Jan Mas, who gave uh, all the complete references to the people that he mentioned, which is excellent. Uh, I apologize for that, but uh, you know, if you were in his talk, you saw most of these names. Maybe not Leonard, but most of these names. And uh, the the one that uh, Jan talked about was based on you know these two. Um, but he also mentioned uh, approaches by Bonchikard, Sturm, etc. So uh, just to summarize. Um, maybe uh, a way to look at the previous talk and the development versus what I will talk about is he mentioned as a result of JKO, Jordan, Kindler, and Otto, and he said, you know, they, can one prove something like that in the discrete context, in discrete spaces? And uh, so our, one way to look at our work is that this result of Olivia Villani and uh, for the discrete cube and say, okay, can we try to prove, first of all, for all t, some result like that on the discrete cube, and then more generally, can we do prove something like that? Can we formulate and prove something like that for uh, jet for graphs? Okay, so it's it's a point of departure that's different, and then uh, our development is quite different. So as I said, here here is the, with the constant c one over sixteen. This is the result of uh, 
um, Olivia Villani. And the second one shows, in fact, as I indicated, with the W1. Okay, so this, this is, um, so there's a definition that will come up in a second, but W1, is some, in computer science sometimes it's known as the earth mover distance. So we have two measures. Uh, this is the L1, um, uh, you know, this is, this is really counterbench. <laughs> Uh, distance between measures nu0 and nu1 where there's some underlying distance here it's the graph distance but in any metric space and you take uh, the best coupling jo joint distribution between nu0 and nu1 and the cost is the linear cost sum over all pairs distance between x and y and uh, say gamma xy which is the which is the mass, the joint distribution with marginals nu0, nu1 <coughs> that assigns to a pair x1. Okay, so, and this is the usual relative entropy. So, so mu can be any measure on, uh, actually they, they restrict to uniform measure on, on the discrete cube, but uh, nu0, nu1 uh, can be anything, and then the theorem is that, um, that nu0, nu1 uh, induce new one half. So new one half is now on the midpoint set that I defined. Um, for you look at the support of new zero, new one, and then look at midpoints if, uh, for this. If the support is A and B, uh, midpoints as I defined, and then new one half is is uh, is a measure on the midpoint set. Okay, and the relative entropy of this satisfies that property. And so this, this is what Jan Maas talked about. So he introduced uh, a certain W2 and a certain interpolation um, based on this Fokker-Planck type equation. And um, so I'm going to skip over that uh, and get to what we do. Okay, so this is since... Uh, Okay, and also I believe a student of Michelle Ledoux uh, developed something uh, like what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so one thing is we, we look at different costs, so W1, but uh, we look at a different cost, different notion of a W2 that uh, is now due to Catalin Martin. Okay, so, and then from that we can derive statements for W1. So again, as I said, our motivation is can one prove a theorem like, uh, can one develop an interpolation between given measures mu0, nu1, and prove a theorem like uh, Olivier Villani for say, general graphs. And we formulate it first of all, and then uh, ask for what is potential, what, what is potentially the role that we saw um, C over N, 1 over 16N in their theorem, is for general graphs. Okay, so W1 squared, so I'll introduce this tilde, W2 tilde, in a little bit, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that uh, Kathleen Martin introduced in uh, proving generalizations of Talagrand's results and so on. Okay, so here is the theorem, but, uh, but it, won't, uh, it won't be completely um, defined yet, because I have to tell you what mu t pi is. Um, So there are two statements here. Turns out, so the second one implies the first one because this this W two tilde <coughs> that due to Martin uh, satisfies an inequality relating to W one that that gives one. Um, uh, so I'll explain. So the, in the next few minutes, my aim is to explain the terms that you see in here, namely uh, W two tilde, but also what I mean by mu t pi. What is the interpolation that we do? I have to explain. And, but the point is that we're able to derive a result like Olivier Vilny for all t between 0 and 1. So we introduce an appropriate interpolation that does. Uh, but one thing I will already confess and tell you is 
nu t is not going to have support just on the midpoints at m sub t. Okay, it's going to look at all geodesics between a and b, and then we, we will introduce uh, an appropriate binomial distribution with parameter t, and the uh, number of tosses depends on the distance between points in a and b. And, um, and, I'll, and pi is going to be a joint distribution with marginals um, nu zero, nu one. Okay. So our one contribution is that okay, there one can define a discrete interpolation as an interpolation between measures <coughs> on, on a graph, so that a result of this type is true um, on the discrete cube. Okay, so I wrote down explicitly, so this might look funny, I'll explain where it comes from. So pi I already mentioned, so nu t pi, it has this explicit form where, so, so if you're interested in what this assigns to some point z, what you're doing is, so delta z refers to the fact that z has to be on a geodesic between, you know, the sets A and B I referred to earlier. And then it has this binomial list. But I'll explain more, more carefully here. So, can yeah. I ask you just a kind of orientation question? Sure. Is this entropy function here sort of negated in the same sense it was in the previous talk? Or, uh, or is this what we usually... Yeah. So this is the this is the relative entropy. So in, in this discrete case, this is just summation over x. Let me call this nu x, nu x log nu over mu. So oh, so this is positive. So it's the usual. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's the usual. This is not negative. Okay. This is the same as before. It was a minus sign. Yes. To be the uniform, is it gonna be simple or it's this, it has the same difficulty? To, to, or I mean, similar difficulty? Oh, similar difficulty, yeah. You can assume u is uniform, and it's um, basically what, what's not difficult to do is if you have a two point space or any complete graph, you know, you can write down explicitly what this uh, the quantity on the left is and take the second derivative and can derive a Brunman-Kosky type. You know, you could show convexity of an appropriate functional. We can do that. And the second thing we, we can do <coughs> is tensorization. And that's basically how we get on 0, 1 to the n. This is a discrete cube because it's a product of n edges, which are, say, complete graphs. But if you give me something like the symmetric cube, I'm in trouble. Symmetric group, I'm in trouble. <coughs> But de defining it, you know, is not difficult. So there's a little footnote here. This this is just saying that, of course, I haven't shown you what W two tilde is, but it satisfies, you know, by Cauchy Schwartz some inequality between the, you know, more well known W one, um, and that's how you get one. Okay. So let me move on to. So Jan Mas showed uh, in in maybe partly in response to uh, Sergey's question, okay, why should one care for this sort of displacement convexity of entropy type inequality? And one answer is uh, that uh, at some point I'll show you a, a chain of implications. It gives you, you know, all the way from Prakopa Leindler uh, and Hans Brun Minkowski and, uh, but also Talagrand's transport uh, entropy <coughs> inequality and uh, and then consequences of that for concentration of measure and so on um, so but you may say well those we know how how to prove already anyway so what is new that this is telling me and I think that's a legitimate question um, but when you try to do in discrete spaces what seems interesting is it raises various questions that are completely natural in the discrete space without this other motivation of displacement convexity, as I tried to indicate with my slide one. I mean, it showed more of my ignorance in terms of what we don't know, but I think these are very interesting <laughs> questions. And one of the simplest things you would try to ask or compute once you introduce something in, on graphs is, what is it on two-point space? Does it tensorize? And then what is it on a path? You know, besides complete graph, 
And uh, so the path is the one that gives to what I wrote here as, a, as an exercise. Um, so even this, I don't think, is well known. Um, so you can ask the kind of Brunnenkowski inequality I'm asking for if you have, if you have a path or a discrete circle, right? cycle of length n. And my guess is these are known and derived using the classical Brunnenkowski on the real line or on, you know, for, the, for the path. But, uh, is that, that related to the exercise on the board? Yes. So, but, and uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago at the, uh, at the AIM in Palo Alto, American Institute of Math, you know, with a group of us, particularly the guys so far I haven't mentioned, my co-authors, and uh, the two here, uh, Sergey's student James Melbourne, and then uh, my postdoc at Georgia Tech, Will Perkins, uh, we managed to show, at least on Z, that using brun minkowski on the real line, in fact, you can uh, derive on the integers. But again, this is this probably, you know, Sergey gave us some references going back to the 50s, <coughs> where they might have known that. Um, but Does what's, it tensorize? Uh, so well, we don't know in the discrete case. I mean, the classical ones, the, the continuous case, they tensorize. So, for example, on Z2, I don't know how to prove something like this. Okay, so, okay, what is this exercise? So, you know, take a subset, two subsets of integers, and A plus B is, is as in the usual sum set inequalities in additive combinatorics, which is, I guess, you'll see more in the third workshop. Um, you know, you take all pairs of sums. And uh, so M half, the A plus B is this, the midpoint set. I let you round down and up, okay, both. And the, so the natural question is, can we prove this? So. And this you know is true. This I know is true. Yeah, I, I, I have given exercises in classes which I didn't know how to solve, but this is not one of them. Um, actually, this, so as I said, for general T, you can prove this using Brunnenkowski on R, okay, for general T. But the, what makes it exercise and it's more combinatorial is, turns out you can actually prove this using the classical sum set inequality that says the cardinality of A plus B is always at least size of A plus size of B minus 1, which as we, as most people here probably know, is uh, tied for arithmetic progressions. When A equals B, let's say, or A and B are arithmetic progressions with the same common difference. This is tight, and you can use this. Um, and if you want one more hint, besides this, uh, AMGM is the other hint, arithmetic <laughs> hint. But my point of uh, throwing this on the side is that whatever your motivation, original motivation might be, this seems to raise questions that might even be interesting, particularly for t between 0 and 1, not necessarily 1 half from some set inequalities point of view for discrete and common products view. Okay, so there, there's some standard motivation for how you can derive other inequalities starting from this so-called displacement convexity. Oh, by the way, if, I don't know if uh, Jan said it uh, or whether he even used the term displacement convexity entropy. I think he did. Um, but in case you haven't seen that, I hope the name or the phrase is clear. So the, just without the additional distance square term, you're talking about Brunnenkowski, which is in a statement of some sort of convexity. And the displacement convexity term, uh, I believe McCann or somebody introduced, is, uh, is for the fact that you can do better than Brunnenkowski. You're able to get a better inequality, you know, assuming the curvature is positive assuming this kappa in Jan's notation, C over I. In my previous inequalities is positive. You'll be able to do better, and that's the displacement part. OK, so, um, so there was a question in the previous talk, so I got put in this uh, for completeness. So. By geodesic, because we're 
I mean, in graphs we are familiar with geodesics, but the geodesic we'll be talking about is on the measure space, right? So on W1 or W2 and so on. So the interpolation that we will we introduce turns out to be we can show is a geodesic is a W1 geodesic. Okay, in this in this sense, that if I look at W1, so I will introduce the interpolation nu t pi or nu t, so that W1 of nu s nu t, right, in the W1 sense, is going to be equal to t minus s times W1 of nu 0 nu 1. Okay? So that's the property. So again, this I've already said uh, without showing a formal definition, but so, and uh, Jan pointed out that, you know, uh, you, you cannot expect the usual, you cannot expect Talagrand type inequality with the usual or natural way of defining W2 because, um, you know, the, already on a two point, sorry? Because there are no geodesics. Because there are no geodesics and uh, already on two point space you're in trouble and that's why we're trying to find other other paths. So he, this is basically how we build our interpolation. Sorry, yeah, question. Yeah, I was ah, saying yeah. the, the non-uniqueness of the one geodesics is a problem for you? No. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> in, in, at some level, in some sense, yes, because we are only able to do limited things. I mean, you but the non-uniqueness right? so the uniqueness says that you have a choice. Yes. You, you wonder whether there's a, there's some interpolation that you yeah, yeah, I, it's a good point because as you, so I was about to say what the interpolation is. Okay, let me say that and then I can, I can come back to that point. So first imagine you have, uh, you know, just 0, 1 through n. And then uh, uh, he, here, is a, here is, a, is a simple interpolation. And, and this we can use on a general graph. Okay, so imagine you have a Dirac mass at zero and then, uh, you know, also at n. And now you take the usual just binomial distribution. Okay. And so how does that give us our interpolation? Yeah, so let me put the slide up, but it, it may look a little bit complicated. Let me say in words what we do. So first for Dirac mass between two points, let's say x and y, take a random geodesic, so random shortest path. Okay? And once you have a shortest path, you do the previous, you do the binomial distribution on the path. Where, where binomial, with what's the number of tosses, it's the distance, okay, which is the sum integer, positive integer. Binomial with parameter Biometer, parameter t for probability and the distance for the other parameter. Okay? This is if you have two Dirac. Now what is nu t pi? So given nu 0, nu 1, Take any, okay, if you want optimal coupling, <coughs> but for any joint distribution pi whose marginals are nu 0, nu 1, you simply extend it, you know, by writing it as a, as a sum over Dirac mass, okay? So let me give an example. And here there's a proposition, but the proposition, so nu t pi can be defined the way I just, I just said, but it's more useful if you know pi is optimal. You can take any joint distribution of nu 0, nu 1, but if it's uh, optimal in the sense, you know, if the joint distribution is the one that gives you equality in W1 of nu 0, nu 1. Right? W1 is defined over best over all couplings. Otherwise, it's, you know, maybe pseudo-geodesic. So here, 
two simple examples just to write it down explicitly. I mean, you know, on a complete graph, you know, the, all the distances are either 0 or 1. So you just, you're either, so when is it 1 minus t? Here's another way to think about walking along a geodesic. So t tells you how many, sorry, t is the binomial parameter. So the number of heads tells you how far you've moved going from x to y. So if in the complete graph case, you only have 0 or 1, right? Because it's distance 1. So if you were unsuccessful with probability 1 minus t, you stay at x. If you're successful, you go to 1. For all other ones, it would be 0. Yeah, so complete graph, it doesn't depend on the coupling at all. Okay, it's just this simple linear. And you can do the computation for the n cube, right, following the recipe. So you see these factors because what you have to figure out because, now I'll address Almut's question. So we don't take a single geodesic. Then becomes a question of, you know, what, what is a smart way to choose on the discrete cube? Does it help to take the lexical graphically first, you know? The, the one that says, go from left to right and see which are the ones you need to fix in going from x to y. So we haven't developed that approach, taking a, a single path and then taking a binomial or some distribution. For the tensorization, so we have something that justifies, uh, or oh, two comments on this binomial. First of all, this, is, this idea is due to uh, uh, Johnson, due to uh, O. Johnson in his paper on, uh, you know, entropic central limit, central limit theorem uh, for Poisson distribution. Um, so that's that's where this is from, and for tensorization to work, you know we can show that the binomial is is forced upon you. But what we haven't done is rather than taking all geodesics between A and B, the supports of mu zero and one. What happens if you just take somehow one canonical one that we have? And that that might uh, force us to think more about somehow a unique geodesic aspect, yeah. <coughs> okay, so we can write down explicitly, this is something like this is what we get. Um, right, again, this is just to illustrate that for Dirac mass you get something like this, but then now you have a joint distribution pi with mu zero and mu one as the marginal, so mu t pi would be summing over all x, y with that, okay? So the definition of mu t pi, more or less clear. And you know, more generally, you can write it down explicitly what it is. But what you get is, of course, for any z, if you, if you say, you know, what's the mass on z, then it depends on number of shortest paths between x and y, or x0, x1, that use z compared to total number of geodesics. Okay, so that's the ratio. Okay. So the other one in my theorem, so most, basically I'm spending most of the time trying to explain various <coughs> things in our theorem, which is, which is, what, uh, which is already some non-trivial thing. Okay, so this this is the the one that's due to Catalin Martin. I said that uh, that we use. Um, again, you know, one one could just work with W one, but the whole, as Jan tried to indicate, the whole point is to somehow come up with a notion of W two in discrete spaces that, with the hope that that's stronger than the usual W one. So. You know, this, uh, for graphs, you can just think of these integrals as summations and the joint distribution between u0 and u1. This is not symmetric, unless, unlike uh, w1. Okay, so this is u1 with respect to u0. And similarly, you consider t2 of u0 with respect to u1 and take the sum of the two. Okay, that, that's something what we call w2 squared. So, it turns out, depending on where you put the square, you get three sort of distances here. 
The strongest one, you know, as you can expect by Cauchy's words, is when you put the square on D. Okay, if you put the square here, then you get square of the usual W2. If you put the square all the way outside, then you get W1 square. And this is this is in between. And that that uh, Martin used, and then uh, one of my collaborators, Paul Mary Samson, uh, also worked with it. He has some papers on it. Okay, so that that's uh, D2. This is just uh, saying what I said already. So in our theorem, the W2 tilde is when I take the mixture, the sum of. As I said, this is asymmetric, so we take the in each direction. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Even on continue. Yeah. We, again, as I said, because. <coughs> right, but for uncontinuous, imagine uncontinuous, you have the square here. But if the transition was, uh, was a deterministic, uh, it ah. would be the same. Uh, but that assumes something about your joint distribution, yeah. Okay, well, one other thing is I, I realized as I was going through the slides uh, just before the talk, um, if you just identify this quantity after, you know, before taking the info over pi, for any given joint distribution pi, we, we use I2, you know, don't ask me why, but I2 of, uh, you might see a quantity in, uh, in a theorem later called I sub 2, and T2 is info over pi of I2. Okay, there, there's some remarks about, so maybe I'll wait for a second, about, uh, you know, you can ask, okay, what, what is this distance if, uh, what is this T2, the distance on the measured space, if you have a very simple distance, 0, 1, right? Okay, then it, it turns out it's not, uh, it's not so strange, um, which is relevant for two-point space. So, so the this slide is showing one part of how we prove the result on the discrete cube. As I said, you prove, we prove something on the two-point space and then tensorize. But on two-point space or any complete graph, you now that I introduce mu t pi, okay, so you look at the relative entropy of mu t pi with respect to mu. Mu is your, it could be counting or reference measure. And just take the second derivative. Okay, this you can do explicitly. And you should get that this is at least that. So now you say, okay, that means this minus t squared over 2 times w2 tilde squared is convex. And so plugging in at t equals 0, 0, and 1 compared to arbitrary t gives you inequality. Okay, basically, just checking for convexity of this function. Okay? So the proof of that is just following this and a little bit more of algebra. So, and then, as I said, you know, the W2 tilde you can relate to W1. So, notice that, so if you haven't seen these kinds of things, you might say, okay, well, how should I get any feel for it, or what is this good for? However trivial this seems, we are on a two-point space, it gives something interesting and useful that you might have seen before, namely the Pinsker inequality, right, that says total variation square is at most relative entropy. So, for example, take um, your reference measure mu, take, take mu zero to be your reference measure mu, okay, mu zero. If mu zero equals mu, then relative entropy of this guy is this zero. Okay. And and this is non-negative, so I'm going to just throw this away. 
relative antifig nu t pi is non-negative. So what I get is that this term t relative antifig nu 1 is less than or equal to t times that. So cancel t and then let t go to 0. So you, you get that this is at least, okay, even, so even in this somewhat trivial case, you, you get something that you might have seen before. Okay, so this, this is the, I already mentioned how we go from two point to uh, in general. Um, so the, perhaps the, in terms of tensorization, what might be slightly different or new is it's not the usual tensorization that you've seen for product measures. This is something that in the literature is referred to as, uh, I guess, the independent works of Knopf and Rosenblatt introduced it. Um, but this, this is somehow a very easy thing to do, you know, even when you don't have a product measure. Just write it using conditional distributions, right, on when you have on two points. Um, and it's that one that works well for us for the tensorization result. Okay, so la, let me be brief. And as Jan Maas indicated, you know, starting from displacement convexity, so he, he mentioned you can def derive modified log sub-level inequality, and then from that, you know, concentration or other things like uh, decay of uh, Markov kernel to equilibrium and so on. Um, so we, you know, we're not too pleased with what we are able to do, but Perhaps a small uh, gratification is that in, at the end we are able to derive using the central limit theorem the usual log sobola with the optimal constant for the Gaussian. So gross is the result. Uh, it surprises a little bit because in the middle we prove the modified log sobola, not the usual log sobola on this three. But okay, and then. So this HWI goes back to Otto Villani uh, work. Uh, you know, so and, so and this diagram applies to every graph or to this Yeah, so or? every, uh, yeah, as with all diagrams, if you can establish this displacement convexity of the type we, I mentioned for the discrete okay. then, yeah, under that hypothesis, you can prove this, you can prove that, you can prove a discrete Prokopa line law. So okay. what is the uh, how, what is the largest generality? It's for any metric spaces of some type, or I mean, so uh, or okay. measure spaces, or I good. So <laughs> now I can say, okay, when can you? When does this diagram hold? Okay, that's a great question because um, right. <clears throat> so as I'm, I think, going into negative minutes pretty shortly. Let me, uh, let me address that question. So, so far I hope I managed to convince you that it could be interesting or it could be powerful to have such an inequality. Okay. And one might even define, if you can prove such an inequality, whatever the constant is in front of the distance square, you might say maybe that's a lower bound on your Ricci curvature for your graph, okay? which for the cube would be constant over m. And this was the point of view taken by Olivia Villani. Okay, no. they, so Isn't it always true that the balls are closer than the centers? Also in negative curvature? I mean, I don't... Uh, it's probably not true. If you no, in negative... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is for positive curvature. I think they mean strictly. So. No, it's, it's, this is transportation, is. right? So this is not, this is not uh, yeah, trivial. Uh, Okay, so let's measure of the balls is closed. Okay. So, okay, I want to take quickly a couple of things. There is a coarse Ricci introduced by, you know, sort of almost, uh, uh, it was actually in my student's thesis, Marcus Samara, in 2005, last time we had this related special semester here. Um, but I didn't encourage him to develop this, <laughs> so it's my fault. But. Uh, Olivier actually developed it quite well, and again here you can say maybe it's, it should be referred back to Dobrushin, you know, this notion of uh, Ricci curvature. So what is it? And now the understanding is that it's probably weaker than the, than the one suggested by displacement convexity. 
But this is fairly natural. It's not surprising for people in Markov chain. Here, what this is saying is, you take two points, say nearest point, and two uh, distance one. Take uh, take a random step from each one, and then compute uh, W1 of where you are. If you're closer by some, right, if it's a contraction, then you say that's a, that's a local Ricci, and then, as usual, you know, the best lower bound of this type is a lower bound on your Ricci. Okay, this is what Olivier started with. That suggests for the cube, uh, 1 over n. If you do that for symmetric with random transpositions, it suggests n choose 2. But all other, in my chart, modified log sobolev spectral gap, concentration, all these are of the order 1 over n. So this is why it would be very interesting to figure out whether displacement convexity for symmetric group under Hamming or transposition distance holds, and in particular if it holds with 1 over n. That would show that this is in fact coarse and weaker. Okay? So, uh, I put a conjecture here, boldly, that it should be 1 over n. Um, Okay, this is, let me, uh, all we are able to do, as I said, uh, is, is that you have the following, just zero, zero curvature statement for the symmetric group, for t equals one half. I don't even have this for all t. And this uses uh, Jerome Sinclair type canonical path argument, because you can, once you have this, you try to form an induction between, I mean, sorry, an injection right, from A cross B to the midpoint set square. And you can do that by looking at permutations, looking at the difference as cycles, which is natural, and then try to fix them in some canonical order. This, actually, for the simple case uh, without curvature, this is what Olivier Villani do. They do a, a canonical path argument. But then for the to get the curvature term, they need to use a concentration inequality, saying that the midpoints are quite representative and so on. And it turns out for symmetric group, one to push that approach results, throws us into proving concentration on non-nested partition lattice, which is, which is quite, seems quite non-trivial. So that's where we are. And uh, so let me skip the proof of how we do that canonical path thing. So now if you if if you dare to define that as your notion of curvature, of course it can be negative, right? For graphs, let's say forget about everything that we've seen in terms of measures, and say we do something like this as the notion. You know, you pick a graph at random, <laughs> it's going to have negative curvature. <laughs> so it's not clear how useful it is, but there are special graphs where they could have positive curvature, it could be very useful. But the negative curvature for a random graph is reasonable. Yes, the question, next question might be what can we do with it? If I know this statement for some lower bound than kappa, however negative, what can I do with it? So what's the red, uh, what, what is in red? <laughs> This is typesetting. The red is the last statement in each slide, unfortunately. No, no, no. But what right. is it saying? Yeah. How, how do we read this? Okay. Yeah, so take, let's read that by taking with, uh, okay, let's read item two first. Just to take a star graph. It's extreme because take any subset, two subsets A and B, there's a unique midpoint, right? So how can you ask for any sort of lower bound? Okay. I mean, this shows Ricci, which is usually a local notion of curvature, is in fact accurate even in the graphs, because locally you can manufacture a star in a graph. If you have girth phi, why girth phi? Because that means for neighbors of this vertex, there is no other shorter path. They can go through this common point, but any other path has to involve. But that already, yeah, so that's, isn't it of interest for you if A and B are substantial? Yes, and uh, but this is just this is just a warning. 
that means if you define simply using that, this, this could be negative. Of course, we, yeah, as you were, what you're saying is A and B are substantial or sufficiently far apart. But I mean, just the general definition would be, I mean, they could be substantial, but you can have, so here, for example, take complete bipartite graph. A and B are on the same side, N and N plus 1. All their midpoints are on the other side. Again, you're in trouble. Random graphs. So going back to Gil's question, the question is, you know, is negative curvature still useful somehow? And then find more examples of positive curvature. Yeah, the random graphs will have because, you know, they would have, say, random deregular graph. They would have large curve. Let me see if you really strange here, because if you have a substantial random graph, and, and I would think in any decent expanded. Yes. Uh, the, yeah. the mid points, there, is, there are no bottlenecks, right? So how can the, the mid set be small? So, I mean, is this a, at all of interest if, if you had an inequality like this, let's say if A and B are, are omega of A and B size? I, I think, I think it, it is, I think it's, 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 it's because the nature of Ricci is, is local. What you're saying is, well, let me disregard this lo local, yes, which then it could still be Well, interesting. couldn't you actually manufacture even sort of large sets? Because this is, this is transport here, right? So you could take a large, well, a lot of, you know, neatly pair up a big set A with a big set B, but, but just going, the, or they have, have, have a local phenomenon happen constant times and times, so even in the expander. No, 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 because you connect anyone in connect the, any, anyone. No, there's a, so I think the, prop, uh, the point is that that you can match up like k points to k points, but with not with the shortest pass. So the point is here that Perfect. you are matching them up with the shortest pass, yeah. and and you can with a longer pass you can do that, but not, but not. The sh yeah, let me just understand. So I'll, I'll make a statement which may be complete nonsense. So if if, if the graph is a, is a reasonable expander, yes. and A and B are somewhat largest, they're at least size epsilon n, yes. there is such an inequality mass point. Is this obviously completely wrong? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because if they have a middle question, point, as, point, as, point. because of what uh, Maria said, because if I arrange the that the Right, them. They could be well connected, but their nearest path is such that. So, so there may be, yeah. so maybe uh, <laughs> give us answer a uh, question from the beginning. But you connect any two, right? You're looking at all geodetics. They might be paired, but you also connect everyone from here. Mm -hmm. the, the, mid, the midpoint set will separate A and B. So sure. Will, so yeah. if you have an expander, it will be also, this midpoint set will also be linear. So, so you'll get an equality of this yes, type. I think you want just the <laughs> no. No, if you have an expander. You have an expander and you have yes. two disjoint sets A and B. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm saying something completely trivial. So, I don't, so, the, so this set of midpoints will separate A and B. <coughs> why they could be connected I mean, to a longer a very long midpoints are using things. geodesic they could be non geodesic so the connected. geodesic is exactly the shortest right. pass that's yeah. the point this this is the point yeah, but I still don't understand the point exactly. okay so we have we have, been, we have been in discussion <laughs> phase by the way there is a way you, you are measuring your, your midpoint yes you shouldn't say ah if uh, between two yes. the same no, no, <laughs> Sorry? So the problem is with your left on side of inequality, yes. Uh -huh. The way you are measuring is. You don't like floor and ceiling? But it should be like that. Ah. Uh, yeah, maybe you should know, if you are close to one, yes. this one should be more weight than the other okay. one. Okay. Maybe no, you should no. not insist. Yeah, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm just asking for less than what you're asking for. And I still have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know. So, so if, I could go right, on. So, so, just, so, I understand. so if you take take any take any expander, take start with two sets A and B that are huge but separated by by distance five, and now 
add an extra vertex mm -hmm. artificially that is connected to all of them, to all of A and all of B, then this vertex would be the unique midpoint of this definition. Okay. Maybe we, should yeah, fine. Maybe we should relax also the notion of geodesic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to allow, yeah. to allow uh, you know, approximate geodesic. Which is, which is no, what Bonsu no, managed to be. They relaxed the notion of geodesic. Any other questions? We have some way past. Uh, did you finish? Wait, it's a question we should clear. I finished uh, already. <laughs> 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 Laurent wants to ask, but he's being polite. So this holds in Z and also. Sorry? Th this holds in any dimension? No, that I don't know. Why because can't you use Bloom and Mikowski on I, But so here, you know, the, the proof is quite fragile. Rounding up and down, as I cheated, doesn't matter so much. But then when on Z2 already, maybe there is a way, but it's not What's the obvious. What's the difference between Z2 and Z2? I mean... Well, so for, from, R, from the statement on R2, I have to find an appropriate rounding. And, I mean, take some proof here to show that I can discretize it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And because you get points, when you take T times a point in R2, T times a point in, uh, in R2, 1 minus T times another point, I get some real number. And I have to find midpoints in R2 and map them to midpoints in Z2 appropriately. And it doesn't, doesn't work as smoothly. I, I don't know. <laughs> but this is, this is two weeks old, so <laughs> first we said we should find out maybe it's known. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So how about to, like uh, if we are in the dense setting, can we hope for a Zemeredi type thing that we say like we oh. remove epsilon fraction of the edges, then the graph would satisfy using all the you know, things like that. Have you looked at those like, statements? I'm a little pessimistic with the existing definitions because it's Maybe add, based on Yuval's <laughs> suggestion of add one point, add a few edges. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure that the intuition is good in the high curvature. Or, or but, uh, if, if we are, usually it seems that we are interested in going to inequality for large sets A and B, like far apart. Okay. And in that case, uh, counting the the size of uh, the support or, or the entropy of the of mm -hmm. the optimal plan between uh, A yeah. and B, yeah. saying that this is R seems much uh, stronger than saying that the Zim Minkowski do because. Uh, yeah. You have to map um, uh, the, the, the points. I mean, you're a. just saying, uh, absolutely. I, 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 it's I, because you have the extra term, right? We're saying sorry. stronger than. I mean, displacement convexity is stronger than, much stronger yeah, than. Yeah, I know Bruce. it is stronger, but, yeah, but, but if you, we are interested in obtaining Bronikovsky and Brass, isn't it uh, <coughs> too, I mean, way too strong to try to deduce it from, uh, from, um, from uh, convexity? Um, you have a lot of, uh, of midpoints. Uh, it's much larger than the support of the... Yeah, yeah. It looks like I think so. I think so. At least in it seems. Knowledge. I mean, that's why it's not... Well, it's a small 